Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Cross, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this Royal Opera House Insight, where tonight we'll be exploring George Benjamin's brand new opera, Lessons in Love and Violence. This work, as I'm sure you all know, will be taking to the stage here at the Royal Opera House next month. The opera is inspired by Elizabethan drama, specifically Christopher Marlowe's Edward II. And in general, one might say that the opera follows the general sweep of the play from the troubled court of the king through the murders of his lover Gaveston and the king himself to the execution of Mortimer and finally at the instigation of the young king, uh, that execution of Mortimer. But as the title of the opera suggests, Lessons in Love and Violence, its central theme is, well, millennia old, uh, that of the struggle between love and political power. No violence, please, sings the king in the first scene. Let ours be a regiment of tolerance and love. Yet he's allowed his country to slide into civil war and has maintained his hold on power through acts of terrible violence. And it's these acts of violence that punctuate the course of this opera. Political turmoil, unstable leadership, how to find love inside the machinery of politics, this, it would seem, is an opera as much about our own time as it is about the time of Marlowe or, indeed, of Edward himself. So, Lessons in Love and Violence will be here on the stage of the Royal Opera House between the 10th and the 26th of May, and you can find out a lot more information about it, and, indeed, you can buy tickets via the Royal Opera House website. Now, for tonight's insight, we are very fortunate to be joined by the makers of this piece, uh, the composer of the music, George Benjamin, the writer of the text, Martin Crimp. They're going to tell us about the making of the piece and give us some insights into the production that's taking shape on the stage. We're going to talk to two members of the cast, Barbara Hannigan and Stéphane Degou, about their characters, about what it's like working with this team on this new production. And we're also very privileged to get a, a sneak preview of some of the music from the opera. And then at the end, there'll be time for you to ask some questions too. So please be thinking up those questions as we go along. So now, without further ado, please welcome composer and conductor George Benjamin and writer and playwright Martin Crimp. <laughs> welcome both. Or perhaps I should say welcome back, because uh, this is not the first time both of you have had <laughs> works presented uh, at the Royal Opera House. This is indeed your third collaboration, which has uh, been, been presented here. Now, yours is clearly a, a successful and enduring partnership, and uh, I'd like to hear in a little while about how that actually works, if we can get inside that, that creative process. But just to begin, it would be interesting to hear how how you came together. Uh, you both had already established international reputations for yourselves as, as a playwright and as a composer. So uh, why did it take you so long to get round to writing an opera together? I mean, George, you, you'd be wanting to write an opera for a long time, but had never quite found the right collaborator? Uh, that's an uh, underestimate of my problem, uh, <laughs> because I was searching to find a collaborator for almost a quarter of a century. I've always loved opera. I wanted to write for music theatre. And so periodically, from the, my mid-twenties, uh, for a long time, I've met any poet, any playwright, any director, any film director who would meet me, and it all came to nothing. Nothing. A few times I met someone three or four times, but it, it, never, it never worked. And in fact, by about 2003 or four, I, I consciously gave up. I thought... I don't know how to write operas today. I don't know how to handle the problems that I want to tackle. But above all, I don't have someone to work with. And then, in 2005, a mutual friend of ours, the musicologist and wonderful viola da gamba player, Lawrence Dreyfus, who is a colleague of mine, was a colleague of mine where I teach composition at King's College London. We had lunch one day, and he mentioned Martin's name and mentioned it in a very, very... Um, laudatory and very, very enthusiastic way, and without going into detail, he fixed in the most subtle and generous way for us to meet. So, what did you think, Martin, when out of the blue you had this call from a, a, a composer saying, write me a text for an opera? Well, it, it was, um, I mean, I have a kind of similar experience because as a playwright, 
I'd actually been approached before to write for opera, and generally I would listen to the music and think it's not for me. So what happened was a couple of CDs arrived in the post, and I put one in the player. It was piano music, because I play the piano, so I wanted to hear some of this composer's piano music, and I was just captivated from the first few bars, and I knew this was the person that I could write words for. So what possibilities did this present to you, the prospect of writing a text for an opera, as well, opposed to a straight play? Yeah. Well, um, a learning process, um, but also having heard the music, I knew I was being offered a very special opportunity to have my words embedded in something quite extraordinary. So that was, that was my main motivation. And then really, I, because we had a trial run, as it were, uh, with a, a short piece called Into the Little Hill, it was a quite a steep learning curve for me to learn about the necessary compression that is required to write a, a text for music. Because I can put this in a very simple way. If I write a 90-minute play, I know it's going to be a typescript of about 70 pages. If I write a 90-minute text for music, for George, it will be about half that, maybe less. So it's a... It, Compression, compression, condensation. And for you, George, what was it in discovering Martin's work that you knew instantly that this was right for you? He could provide you with the words with which you could work. Well, um, my works have always been published by Faber Music, which is a company which was, uh, still is associated very strongly with Faber and Faber, um, who are Martin's publishers. And um, I have a very close friend in Faber, in Faber who sent me an emergency speed. Um, as Martin was listening to this track on the CD, I was, had his complete work sent to me. <laughs> and I read, and I loved what I read. And what I liked immediately and thought, apart from the personality I'd, I'd already... No, I hadn't yet encountered. Um, but what I liked was the language, its compression, its, its great emotional um, strength. Um, and it's, it seems both utterly comprehensible and clear, fantastically clear, but very strange. And it's that strangeness that I thought that could give birth to music. Um, and then, then we met, and, it, and we sort of clicked, didn't we, I think, yeah. over lunch. And so we, and after the, at the end of that lunch, we sort of said, OK, let's give this a go. <laughs> and so, as you mentioned, Martin, your first collaboration was this chamber opera, if we can describe it as that, Into the Little Hill. Tell us a little bit about that. It was commissioned by the Autumn Festival in Paris. It's based on the uh, Pied Piper of Hamelin tale, loosely. What did you both learn from the, that, that first encounter, that first process? You described it as a steep learning curve. Um, what did I learn? I think at first I, I, um, I learned not always to resist. At first I was quite resist, resistant to the story of the Pied Piper for linguistic reasons because the word Pied Piper in English doesn't appeal to me, because the Germans call it the Rassenfänger, I think this is right, which is a much more appealing title. And it wasn't until I went to the British Library and I discovered uh, a short text telling this story from around 1604, I think it was, in a book called um, The Restitution of Decayed Intelligence, <laughs> which, was, which was a book which was trying to set the record straight about history. And I found this story told in an incredibly objective, straightforward way. And that's when I knew that I was able to move forward with the story. And also what really appealed to me, I think something that appeals to both of us that we've often talked about is constraints. I knew there would be just two singers. So that immediately got me really interested in how do you present a story with several characters with just two singers, including some choruses. And George, what did you take from it? You, know, you moved from this chamber piece now to two full-scale operas on the stage. Could you just talk us through that, that, that process? Yes, Is there a difference between working in the small scale and the large scale for, for you? Nothing dramatic, except obviously everything is expanded in every direction for a, a, a work that has a, a large orchestra and has, lasts approximately an hour and a half. What was interesting at first for me and difficult for me was coping with Martin's natural language, some elements of Martin's natural language, the use of the vernacular, the splits in time and uh, I st at first I wasn't certain how I could work that 
work with that in my, in my musical idiom, but that musical idiom transformed itself to quite a large degree and not only then began to cope with it, but in fact really loved working with every, every aspect of, of his language. Um, I suppose, even when writing Little, Into the Little Hill, that the demands are, yeah, they're, they're, they're sort of the same, and they are how to introduce sufficient diversity to maintain interest and to reflect, and really, really deeply reflect the way the drama evolves and how and how it, uh, uh, what happens during the story and at various levels, um, also to to give the work a certain tenor, a certain uh, a certain tone. I suppose that's the word. A certain feeling, a certain colour, and while simultaneously having sufficient diversity in it, um, and that means you have to search for techniques and uh, ways of writing music and ways for writing for the, for the voice which you haven't done before because the, the drama demands it. Um, and there's the other thing, which is how to cope with the language and, and lang English language and to set and to work well for voices so that the writing is idiomatic, that the language is clear, that people understand at every moment what is going on, not necessarily with use of sur surtitles, and um, to write to enjoy this fantastic resource which is the, the human voice, which is infinitely expandable and extraordinarily unbelievable object. So then came your next large-scale collaboration, which was written on ski, a hugely successful work, which began in Aix-en-Provence and then came to the main stage here at the Opera House. And now here we are with another full-scale opera uh, for, the, for the Royal Opera House. Can you talk us about the, the origins of this, this piece? Where, where did the idea, where did the initial seed for this, this particular piece come from? Martin? Um, Yes, well, I, <laughs> we read lots of books and look at lots of stories before we're thinking about doing a, a new piece of work. And I had a little run on reading um, Elizabethan plays. And that's when I came across Christopher Marlowe's play, as you've, you've already referred to, Edward II, um, which I shared with George. And he thought, that, yes, this was a story which had the necessary intensity. Um, but I should stress that this is not an adaptation of Christopher Marlowe's play. Um, Marlowe's play was a point of departure, and then there are many other sources which have been used. Some of the, the um, English historians that you all in the audience will have heard of, like Holland Shedd and Stowe. And also I went to the library. I looked at Isabella's household records. And there's very important text, which is uh, uh, the, a Latin life of Edward II, which is almost contemporary with his life. It was written in the 1320s. And this is where I discovered that um, Gaveston, the king's lover, is called Maleficus, which doesn't mean a bad person. It means a sorcerer, somebody who can do magic. And I think this is something that really appealed to us and which we've taken forward into, into the work. So that's, yes, we... We, 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 we looked for lots of other looked, subjects on the way to yes, finding yes, it, so yes. we really... Some of them got even quite far. They did, they yes. did. That's the next opera, not this one. <laughs> no, that's no opera. <laughs> no, no, if you were the, we, I abandoned something on, on, en route, and once you abandon, maybe you save a few words or phrases, but you don't go back in that way, you can't. So would, would you be happy to share with us some insights into that, that creative process, that journey? So you, you, found, you, you eventually found a subject matter that you were both happy with. Uh, and then how does it work from there? Do you work alone? Do you collaborate all along? Does it go in, go in waves? Do you wait for the text to be delivered, George? Or uh, are you talking all the time to... Well, first of all, we talk and we meet and we discuss how many singers, what type mm, of singers, mm, mm. what type of form. You, I think, asked me for what sort of technical challenges or structural <laughs> challenges I... For instance, I think I did say to you, I would like to, to work with... Written on Skin had 15 short scenes. I'd, I'd like the challenge of working with larger, continuous mm -hmm. scenes. So this one has much, much fewer There's scenes. Seven scenes in this. Seven scenes, and the seventh one is short, so it's six big scenes. Um, and that goes on for quite a long time, doesn't it, before you do any writing or I see anything. That's right. We have a, a, a lot of conversations and we read a lot of books and look at films and just generally kind of share cultural artifacts in a way in order to see where we have affinities. 
with, with different works. So it's a kind of storyboarding, or uh... it is storyboarding. But it, because of the, I think there's a practical thing behind this. I think we're both into practical things. Practical thing is because of the enormous resources which are finally going to be deployed on a, an operatic work. You can't just say to a producer, well, I, I think I'll just kind of see how it goes and make something up. There has to be a proposal. And therefore, that's quite useful. It's quite a way of focusing one's mind on looking for the thing that you are going to propose. And then once you have a text, then... Well, no, it's oh, not... It's not okay. because, because I think you, once, we've, once we've had enough conversation, you then di my memory is that you disappear and I don't hear from you for like six or nine months. I, I do disappear, I do disappear, but before I disappear, I like to have produced a sample. Yes. Or maybe a couple of samples to make sure that this is the material that is really going to inspire you. So I think that that's an important thing. Then, yes, I tend to go away and do, do <coughs> my work. I think I deliver it. Did I deliver this one in installments? Written on skin, no, I, I certainly I think, delivered no. it in installments. Oh, okay. I think, don't you remember the package that didn't arrive? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, maybe I just went away and, and, and I think that, did it, I? Okay. It, and eventually it did arrive, it did. Okay. sort of two weeks later, and then it was the whole thing, and I'd seen very little of it, I think. Yeah, yeah so it's a... It's a so I have a, eventually, I get a text. And then you, then you do the same, you shut yourself away and um, yes, get to it. Yes, I do very, very much shut myself away. I, I sit on the text, as it were, metaphorically, for a, for a few months, just to see, to understand it, to reread it, but also try to maintain the freshness of, of discovery with it. And then there does come a point when I have to start, yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, then I do disappear, somewhat more, more lengthy disappearance <laughs> yeah, than you. Yeah. <laughs> and um, though we stay in touch, uh, I, Martin is a very good musician, and so when a scene is completed, I, I, I will send it, I'll send it to so you. So there is some to and fro, and you yes. might ask for more or less text in certain places. Very, very, very rarely. Would you ever say to George, oh, I don't like that melody there, can you do something different? No, I would not <laughs> no. say that to George, no. That hasn't happened up to now. Yeah. <laughs> but occasionally, I, just for reasons of, of dramatic timing or st structural control, like if, if I've set some text with very long words, with very expansive setting, and yet I, I, my musical structural instinct is saying, I've got to move on quite quickly, then I might ask Martin on occasion to compress things. So tell us a little bit more about the key themes of this piece, and particularly the idea of violence, which is there in the title, it's, it's throughout the piece, and the, the question of how you set about representing violence in text, in drama, in, in music. Well, the title is Lessons in Love and Violence, and I think it's important to say it's not a didactic work. These are not lessons for the audience. These are lessons that the characters learn within scenes, that they will learn the limits of love and what it can achieve, or the limits of violence, or in some cases, the necessity of violence to achieve political ends. I mean, I would say that one of the main themes, although it's awful for writers to talk about themes because they don't always know what their themes are. But really, it's, it's about desire is one thing, and desire contrasted with political responsibility. The king is a desiring person. He wants to invest his time in the person he loves and in cultural artifacts, the things he really loves. Um, but what this means is he's forced or his nature means that he takes his eye off the ball politically, and this leads to instability and chaos. So it's really a theme of transgression. Um, not really because there is love between men. I think we're in the 21st century now, so love between men is not a, it's not a part of a subculture. It is, it is our culture. It's the culture we're in. So the, the key thing is, is transgression. Somebody says right at the beginning, of the opera, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not loving a man, it's love full stop, that is the problem. And this is the politician who wishes to control the king and focus his mind back on the political situation. So I don't know, I, I always feel anxious talking about themes, but maybe that gives you some idea of what was in my mind at least. And George, for you, you, you respond to these themes and this idea of violence and how do you treat that musically? I mean, it's, it's a very difficult thing. Is it going to be on the stage? Is it not? Is it going to be in the orchestra? 
thinking through this, this, this idea within the context of the, of the text? I deal with notes, and I have what, what seem to me fantastic words to set, but I'm the, it's notes that I deal with. And I, in the period of two and a half, three years that it takes to write a piece, vast number of thoughts go through my mind, but in the end, I write notes and I write music, and though I will think about the themes, in the end, I have to subjugate everything that I do in a musical way to the drama and, it is, uh, and as it evolves. And so I, I, I find it hard to uh, answer your question. And uh, as for how the subject matter within the title are treated in the opera, I think we should admit that we didn't have the title at the very, very beginning. It, it evolved as we went along. We went through not only several subject matters, but several titles before we found one that we, we both really liked. And um, I think I'd much rather that people came to hear it and s respond in their own way than me, te than me, if you don't mind, telling you, you know, how many bass drums there are or, or how loud the brass section is. So. But I think it would be, it would be I'm, not, I'm not going to push you on that, yes. but just to, to have some sense of what the, what the music is, is, is doing. So, for instance, the, the, mm. the voice is singing a, a kind of parlando for most of the time, don't it, they? I don't think it will sound like that, Jonathan, when you hear it. Um, I, I, it may look like that on the page, and, it's, and it has something approaching speech rhythms a lot of the time in order to get the language across. But... Uh, When you, I hope, hear the way that it will be sung, because I've written these lines specifically, every note for the people who will be performing it, and when you hear the way that they integrate into the, into the polyphonic uh, structure of the music, and above all its harmonic element, it will sound, I think, quite a lot more lyrical than, than you might imagine by just looking mm -hmm. at, the, um, uh, at, at the score. Um, music doesn't... Uh, simply represent the drama in a simplistic, two-dimensional way in an opera. It's not trying to manipulate emotions or simplistically um, reflect them in the, dra in the drama. That would be more akin to vaudeville or some other types of, of music. Um, on the other hand, it can't ignore them, but it tries to do it in, in a more complex way, in which, thanks to the capacity for the ear to hear six or seven things simultaneously, there can be something luxuriant and brilliant at the same time as something which is static and sinister, during which, in the inside the texture, something dynamic and harsh is, is evolving. And some of those elements can disappear and others can magnify or mutate. And in other words, it's a very, the, the music's approach to the drama is extremely unstable and, I hope, seemingly very spontaneous. But to give it the the architecture which music, I believe, requires, means also that there has to be some sort of framing and some sort of objective underpinning, some scaffolding and architecture, which in a way uh, makes the drama uh, less predictable and um, uh, maybe, maybe in, in my de desire to, to achieve what I want, maybe deeper. And so in other words, it's, it's simultaneously working both on, on an architectural musical level and seemingly on a, on a completely spontaneous one. That's the des that's, that will be the desire. Um, and sometimes it will be subverting the text. At other points, it will be highlighting certain aspects, maybe things that Martin intended, maybe things he didn't intend. And at all the time that I'm writing, as I'm sure Martin is when he's writing his words, I'm not thinking of the individual moment as the priority, nor trying to have a particularly harsh moment to describe something terrible happening on stage, though there are moments when that's essential. I'm thinking of the architecture of the whole structure and trying, we'll see if I've succeeded, but trying to create something in which uh, things seem spontaneous but necessary. And uh, that the desire is that every aspect of it has a f has really has form, has structure. And if that works, then, yeah, it, it satisfies what, perhaps what music needs and just doesn't uh, reflect or um, exploit the, the drama from moment to moment. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, you're in the thick of rehearsals now. Uh, how's it going? 
<laughs> well, it's going, going very well, I think. I think it's, it's yeah, but this is a team well, that you, you worked with before on, on Written and Skin. Uh, Katie Mitchell, the, the director, and uh, Vicky Mortimer, the, the, the designer. So it's a, it's a team that you know well, and a team you have, have confidence in, and it's obviously a, a hugely collaborative uh, process. Uh, are you prepared to give us a few little insights into what we might be seeing happening on the stage? Well, it's a fascinating... It's a f I mean, when you're alone for such a hugely long time, and I really do mean very alone a lot of the time, to, have, to come and conduct it and work with the people for whom I've written it and Katie, it's a very nice thing to do. It really, really, it really, really is. Plus, uh, um, as we've already said, that we, we chose the precise voices and personalities to rep before... Had, had, had you written your text before we chose the people? I think you knew who some of the people were before you wrote, didn't you? So long ago, George. Uh, yeah, I think you did, Martin. Two of them will be joining us later. Yes, yes I think we knew about them. Uh, yeah, yeah, we knew about yeah, them yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. like five years ago. Of course. Um, and they are uh, relevant to the quality of the, the work itself. They are marvellous. And, and uh, to hear them, perhaps you could understand, when you write a line and its context in the orchestra and it goes through a lot of sketches and it, then it doesn't work and you start to scratch it out and start again... But then to hear it sung for the first few times and then to see the singer get into it and understand it and then bring something of themselves while still remaining very faithful to the text itself, that's, uh, it makes it all worthwhile. And Martin, you've, you've worked many times before with, with Katie. She's directed your plays as, as, as well. So exactly, exactly, exactly. I know Katie yeah. very well. She's, she's directed the, uh, the premieres of several of my plays and I think what I have come to expect from her is a fantastic attention to detail so nobody on the stage will be unattended to and there will be life within every element of the stage. Nothing is left blank, as it were. Everything has been thought about. And I think maybe it is worth saying that one um, uh, very interesting thing is that we, apart from our wonderful singers, we also have 20 actors who we can use on stage to create a sense of the world outside of this very um, intense world of the principal characters. But there are also two very interesting moments where you have the device of a play within a play, which are crucial to this piece. How is that working in this, in this opera, and how will it work on the, on the stage? I'm not going to tell you that. You're not going to tell us. You're going to have to wait till the tenth. You're going to have to come and see it. But um, I mean, obviously, I think part of that is is. Um, is something that has been left printed in my mind by reading a lot of plays from around 1600 because, of course, the idea that the world is a stage and that we are all actors and that then our lives are going to be over like the play is over. I think that's a, it's an idea which is a, a good one and which we should, uh, we should uh, embrace. So a, a final question before we move on to hear some of the of the work. What, what would you like audiences to take away from a performance of this piece? Well, that's a very odd question, actually, for, the, <laughs> for a person who, who, who writes, because I'm completely selfish. I write for myself, and I write what I want to be written. And maybe, I don't know, but George perhaps has his own answer to that question about how he writes. I write what I want to hear, and I make what I want to make. And if what we have done speaks to people, that's, that's wonderful. But I can't say any, any, any more than that. Mm -hmm. so, the, but, but the audience matters to you. It matters, but I think, of course it matters, but I think if one is true to oneself, and if one is excited and has pleasure in one's craft, then that is going to communicate itself to the audience. So I'm not saying that I ignore the audience or that I don't care. Of course I care about all of you lovely audience here, and I want to give you pleasure by talking to you this evening. But that's the same thing, isn't it? It's about the craft of pleasure and communicating the pleasure and the joy in what you have made to other people. But that's only if you can only do that if you essentially please yourself. Because if you start to compromise, then you will not please yourself and you will be looking at a thing that is compromised. 
Well, thank you for the moment, but you're not going anywhere. Uh, we're just taking a, a short pause. Uh, now, of course, as we've, as we've heard, the premiere of uh, Lessons in Love and Violence is still uh, a few weeks away, but we are very fortunate tonight to get a sneak preview of, of a short extract from the opera. We're going to hear a duet between King and uh, Isabel, King and Queen, husband and wife, and this occurs towards the end of the fourth of these seven scenes that you've heard about. It closes the first of two parts of the opera. But rather than me set the scene for you, I think it'd be more appropriate to ask Martin to tell us about what's going on in the excerpt that we're about to hear. OK. Uh, this scene takes place late at night. The king's lover, Gaveston, has been murdered in a perfunctory and unpleasant way. We don't see this. I'll tell you that. We don't see this. But he's received a document that tells him what's happened. His wife, Isabel, is partly responsible for this murder having taken place. But she hopes in this scene that she will be able to get her husband's love back. And she explains to him that she's never withheld anything from him, not her mind, not her body, not her opinions. But she discovers that he is nevertheless wrapped up in the man that he loves and in the man, Mortimer, who is responsible for having Gaveston killed. So she makes the decision that she's got to take her child away, their child away from the king, take the child to Mortimer. This will set up a new family and cause an enormous political division. So this is a little extract from that scene. I, w I want to add, if I may, one, one other thing, which is that we don't like bleeding extracts from our pieces, do we? Mm -hmm. you know, so um, this was quite a hard. This we only sort of decided we would let a bit out <laughs> quite late on, and also despite the absolutely amazing pianist that I have to play tonight, um, Brett and Nick, um, it is not piano music, and uh, in fact this is a this is a nocturne. This move, this, this scene, and the sound world is very continuous and, and actually surprisingly smooth and mainly strings. Um, the, the heavy brass, trombones, and m most of the one trumpet is used at one point are absent, and in the section you're going to hear also, there's no percussion. So it's very much quieter and um, more intimate sound world than it, in other parts of, of the piece. So uh, do please bear in mind, if you hear a tremolo on the piano, it's not that there's a piano tremoloing in the orchestra. It's trying to keep a note going because piano notes die and string notes can last for a long time. So it's, it's, re it's, it's, it's not even a black and white photograph of the, of the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> so with that large caveat, <laughs> uh, we're now going to hear this excerpt from scene four. So please welcome our pianists, Breton Brown and Nick Fletcher, and singers soprano Barbara Hannigan and baritone Stéphane de Gouffre. Of this man. 
Barbara, Stefan, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, it's fabulous to, to, just to hear even a little bit of the music, even with the caveats that George, uh, George uh, gave us. Uh, the intensity of, of, of that scene is, is, is immediately apparent. Could you tell us a little bit, about, from your perspective, about the characters that you're playing at this point in the drama? Barbara, Isabel, what sort of state of mind is she in at this, this moment? Well, as Martin said, I have kind of orchestrated the removal of the man that I know he loves. And I haven't done it necessarily for jealousy. Um, you know, there are reasons why, the, why I've had to do it, political reasons, you know, maintaining the family. And I'm hoping that when I come back at this point to him, after he's had a little time to process, you know, what's happened, perhaps we can begin again. You know, we've had two children, and there is a love, so perhaps it's possible. And there's a point when I realize it's not, and that's it's heartbreaking. So this scene is really that crucial turning point where it yeah. switches. And Stefan, the, the king, I mean, he's, he's distracted at first by reading this letter or the violent account of his, of his lover. Well, he's devastated, he's destroyed by the fact Gaveston has been taken away from him and <laughs> killed. And it's, uh, this scene of, uh, starts two, three days after the, the trap and uh, execution of Gaveston. So he's still reminding, reading the letter for these days. And when actually... Isabel arrives, he just maybe ignores her completely. And uh, when I ask, uh, why have you turned away? It's not a physical thing in the room. It's more questioning our relationship also, in a way, maybe. Uh, what happened? But accusing her. Do I know already she's been organized this, all the trap? And maybe not no. completely, but I suspect yeah, her yeah. to be part of it. I really... <laughs> <laughs> want to, to kill Mortimer, but I, don't, I haven't made a connection with Isabel yet. And what for you both are the, are the challenges more broadly of your characters in the, in the context of the, of the opera as a whole, before and after these scenes? Oh, well, the trajectory, you know, I mean, from, from the beginning of the piece until the end, and you, you have a trajectory of a character, and sometimes it's very clear you know, what the catharsis is, or the break, or the turning point, and in other characters, it's, it's not as clear. I think for me, with Isabel, um, we begin, you know, partway through her, the, her story, so I, I'm aware that, that my husband has lovers. This is not, I mean, it's a problem, but it's not, it's something I've accepted, and but then it gets to a point that I, I can't deal with anymore. So what's fascinating is you know, how, how do we chart that path of development, whether it's up or down, and all the underlying layers of emotion. And this is something, you know, this is the third production I've, I've done with Katie Mitchell, and I know how she works. I still find it unsettling. I'm aware, and I keep telling myself, okay, Katie will 
you know, she will set the bare bones and then she will add every day more and more and more detail, more and more and more layers. And I know that. But at the, at the beginning, I had a little wobble uh, <laughs> in the first week or two or whatever. Or, or, I, because I wanted something to be fixed immediately and instead of just knowing, of course, it's, she has her eye on every detail on stage. She will fix everything. And she just said, Barbara, I'm on it. And I was like, of course you're on it. I know you're on it. But it's my own ego or weakness or whatever. So it's, we're, still, we're still doing it. You know, we, we still have another, another week of, of real stage rehears rehearsals where Katie is the boss. And then after that, George is... <laughs> and Stefan, more broadly, the character of, of King. I mean, he's an extraordinary, complex character who's, uh, you know, obsessed with, with love, neglecting the, the country in a sense over which he, he rules, and yet uh, these acts of violence are, are, are occurring around him. Um, his, uh, from your perspective, his place in the how you, you think of this role in the context of the opera as a whole. Well, in this uh, seven scenes, he's. he's coming from having the power and using it to sl not actually quite fast uh, going descent. descent to, well, depression maybe, and until he dies. So yes, there is nothing very positive about this journey, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite dense and uh, intense. Yeah. You, 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 you're keeping your distance from him, are you? <laughs> I mean, well, you, you, you can't keep you, you, of distance. Of course you can't, no, but in, no. I suppose in what sense do you draw on your own resources in order to play, in, to play these, the, these dark or complex uh, characters? You know, I've never been a king before. Never been a king before. Have I been a queen? <laughs> but, but Isabel survives. Uh, she is still alive yeah. at the end of the opera. Yeah, it's a rare one for me. I usually <laughs> die. <laughs> Most, most of the time I die. Um, yeah, I find it, it really gets me down, these rehearsals. I mean, there's no comedy in this piece. And there may be a few moments of lightness, a little bit, but there's, nobody's going to be rolling in the aisles. And <laughs> we had our first run through last Friday, so now it's Thursday. And that was the first time we had all witnessed the piece as a whole with the, st the, the staging. And it affected me very deeply. And I thought, oh, well, maybe I'm just really tired. And, you know, I, I didn't want to, I mean, I was crying, you know, watching. When I was watching Stiff on scenes, I was, I was crying. And then, but then it happened again this week. And then again. And George told us not to gush before we did this interview, so I won't go into it. but. <laughs> But I felt really in the piece and in the embodiment of the piece. And I think that's, you know, when you were speaking earlier about, you know, what are the text and music, it's an embodiment. It's an incorporation. You know, it's not a, a setting. There's nothing to do with a text setting. It's an embodiment of a text un, un, until you have a completely new creature which exists, which is, which is this. So you are hand-picked singers. We heard from Martin and uh, George earlier that, that they very early on had an idea of who they wanted to sing these roles. Uh, George, Martin, could you say something about that process and your involvement with Barbara and Stefan at really quite an early stage before uh, notes existed? <laughs> Barbara, 2008 Lucerne Festival. She walked on stage... Mm. And she sang a, a minute and a half monody, unaccompanied monody. And within 20 seconds, I knew, with written on skin, about to, to become, to be written, I knew that was the, without question, was the person that I wanted to ask to do it. And uh, with Stefan, um, I went to hear Pelias, Debussy's Pelias, at the Festival Hall, played by the Philharmonia Orchestra under Esa Pekka Sanonen. And within few minutes of once he started singing. Again, I, I don't, we hadn't yet even embarked on this one, but I knew that was a, a voice I would love to have the chance to write it for. Once I've had that, I think it's me that goes, goes to more operas than you, Martin, and, and things. So I, I find, uh, then we meet, then we meet you. And I will come, as I'm sure I do with both of you, accompanied you in, in songs, and Martin will be there. Then we, then we meet you. And then um, 
I start to take notes in an instruction manual about how your voices function and what you're good at, many things, a few things you don't like singing, uh, the different tessitura where there's breakages in the voice, singing at speed, all sorts of things so that I can use that later while, I, while I'm writing. Um, and then you met Katie as well, didn't, didn't you, very quickly on. So um, I suppose the initial, therefore, the initial as well, spotting comes, from, comes f from me and then, then we, get to get, we all meet. Yeah, we all meet. But, I mean, it has to be said that people like Stefan and Barbara, from my perspective as a theatre person, are just such amazing actors. But then they also have this other thing that they do, which is the singing. It's just, it's just extraordinary, but because, because I approach it from a different direction. But um, this, is, this is a very beautiful thing for me. Uh, I, I do, actually, I have to say, I do, as an aside, I remember vividly that performance of, uh, of Pelle House at the festival. I, I was there, and there, there was a very, very big man sat next to me. He looked like, uh, how I'd say, big man in leathers, big beard. He looked like a biker. Uh, and he was in floods of tears at the end. I, I looked to my left, and there he was in floods of tears. So it, it kind of moved everybody, not just George, uh, in, that, uh, in that, that performance. So... Um, can you tell us about how you go about preparing these roles? I, I think it would be very interesting to get an insight. I mean, both of you have made, made new works. Uh, you, you just have the notes on the page to start with. There's no, as it were, you are making the history of, of this piece. Uh, how, how do you get yourself into, the, into these roles and prepare for them? Well, I remember I've been given the school uh, in January last year. Mm -hmm. Some of it. Yeah, some of it. <laughs> only, no, no, uh, it was like three scenes, maybe mm -hmm. only two. And, uh, but before I got the scores, uh, George didn't want to talk about this opera and about the story of what it was. So I was, during maybe two years since we met, I actually didn't know what I was going into. And uh, George said, you need to trust me. And I said, OK, I trust him. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really think about it during these years. But uh, once I got the score, I said, OK, I understand now the, why he said, trust me. Because we met three years ago at yours. And he, he me measured my voice, basically. <laughs> took every how high I can go, how deep, how long I can sing a phrase without breathing, everything. And uh, it's really tailored for my voice. And uh, it's, well. There is nothing, he writes for every, every voice's specificities. And Barbara has virtuosity because she's able to do virtuosity. I don't because I'm not able to. <laughs> <laughs> but I have other specificities. And uh, I don't know, it's, when you look at the score, you say, OK, it's, it will be, it's difficult music. It's something you have to go into, and it takes time. but it will be comfortable eventually. And this is very, very important to me to know that I won't struggle with the singing in this. Know the words, actually, because I understand everything and it's extremely clear. And uh, Barbara, you've already said something about working with, with Katie Mitchell. You've all worked with, with Katie uh, before. Could you say a little bit more about the, uh, about the process of preparing this, this production and how you work with a, with a director uh, uh, like her? If I, I, I would like to say something about preparing the score. Yeah, okay. Sure. Because, um, because I, I sing a lot of uh, world premieres, and, and, and because this is the second opera of George's that I've sent, sung, it's when, when I prepare, I very deliberately avoid making choices about how I'm going to sing something. I avoid becoming attached to a certain color, to a certain... Um, uh, use of vibrato to, uh, to uh, if I'm going to play it cynical or pure or angry or am I lying or not lying. I, I don't become attached to anything. I, I will have a lot of possibilities and I will write all those contradictory possibilities down, but I won't make decisions. And I think it's very important in the, in the pre preparatory process um, to keep yourself open because if you become attached to something, it's very hard to let it go. Um, and so I find, find that very important, both musically and dramatically. Um, and we found things, it, it's also frustrating because you're, you feel really exposed 
in those first rehearsals. And, um, but we found things, I think, because of that. We found possibilities in the first rehearsals about, I didn't know what was our relationship and I didn't really imagine what, what it was. And so I think that's in a way why the secrecy is good, that George has his secrets, that Katie has her secrets. She didn't really tell us anything before the first day of rehearsal when she makes the presentation and then you see, okay, what are the costumes like? What's the set like? And so on. You're, it's, it's like all these little revelations that happen every couple of days or even every day um, as the piece builds. And I think that's how you create a piece, any piece, not just a world premiere, but any piece, to, to come really clean to it and, and then try to open it up and find what is there and uncover it. Thank you. And, and Stefan, your experience of, of, of working in the rehearsal room on this piece with Katie and with... Yep. It's the same. Uh, I haven't prepared something like a character or a way to to act and play things. But and uh, last year I was in Aix en Provence last summer, and Katie was there too. So I asked her if we could meet before she leave, before she she left Aix uh, to talk about lessons, and she accepted. But I had the feeling she was not completely um, well. <laughs> And we eventually met, and I asked some questions about this, and she just said, it's a royal family, they are extremely rich, and the set will be a bedroom. And that's it. <laughs> and I said, okay, wow. <laughs> so we spent like a little hour drinking together and talking, but nothing, nothing very, uh, very solid. <laughs> so I've started to work on the score last uh, December, yes, and... Uh, I went through it and first learned the, the notes, which sometimes it's a bit difficult <laughs> and takes time. But uh, I came to the character and the relationships between the characters and situations quite at the last moment, actually, and when we basically started to, to rehearse here. Yeah. And, and George, could you say a little bit more from the musical perspective about uh, these characters and the, their characterization and the differentiation between these different characters in the piece. Gosh. Um. Can you say something about how you confine us? You know how you said in rehearsal that, and, and then you were just speaking about confining, um, you like to be confined and have the, and, and you said something to Peter about how you confined him vocally, and I, I think you do it to all of us in a certain way. Well. In Martin's texts and in real life, there's sometimes when we're talking to each other and there's sometimes when we're having a conversation and we're understanding each other and indeed meaning things and, they, and it flows. But a lot of the time people don't listen to each other. And particularly the extreme moments of emotion that a story like this dem demands and is in Martin's text, they are people are talking to each other and I want to show the fact that they're not communicating and they're going their own ways. You will have heard one example in what I what we just put, performed for you. The king goes back into his text and, and has his crazed and no longer realistic ideas of the revenge he's going to take, because he has no power left, and he's going to destroy cities and cause rivers of blood, while his wife is talking to him, is pouring her heart out, probably saved up for 20 years to show what she really thinks and how he's really hurt her. But there comes a point when he goes back into his own world in which he started the scene and stops hearing her and starts having these crazed ideas of how he's going to destroy a world that he no longer has any control over. And then during that, she says, right, I'm out of here. And to represent that, one of the ways of representing the, some elements of that musically are that when the split happens and they're no longer communi communi communicating, they have to be singing different musics at the same time. And Barbara has a metrical sense to her lines, which is entirely opposed to Stefan's. And Stefan's will be accompanied by certain instruments of the orchestra in a certain way of playing, in a certain type of gesture, a certain type of harmony that is utterly opposed to hers. They have to sound good together and they have to make sense together. If that element of totality isn't organized, then uh, it's not worth doing. Um, but uh, I suppose we're talking about polyphony, of different things at the same time. But when that polyphony is not one of mutual communication, is one of separation and schism, that has to be represented 
absolutely in, in, in the music and in different ways according to the drama as, as it evolves. And I, I like the, the fact of people singing simultaneously. Uh, firstly, it's a pleasure to hear sing, sing, people sing simultaneously, but it's true to life as well. When people are against each other, they shout at each other, they talk to each other, and things overlap. They don't put patiently and politely wait for the other person to say something angry and then respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it's very much responding to the, the, the drama in each, in each moment. There aren't, for instance, you know, uh, Wagnerian leitmotifs by which each character is identified. No, you've said it. Responding to the drama in every single moment, while at the same time being aware that you're having to create a complete structure. There's this extraordinary scene that we spoke about earlier, this, this, this play within the play, as it were, the, the first play within the play at the heart of the opera, where so many different things seem to be going on dramatically and musically at the same time. There, is a, there are two singers singing a kind of uh, madrigal. Uh, it's, a, it's an allegory. It's uh, David's lament for, for, for Jonathan. But there are other characters uh, uh, singing around it. There are other things going on. We're watching the theatre in the theatre. How, how does that work? Uh, how does it work musically? How do you, you prepare such a complex moment like that in the drama? It, it is complex. And there's one word, um, not a very poetic one, it's organisation. <laughs> you have to structure things. The two girls who are singing, the two singers who are singing their aria, they have to have an intervallic and a metrical feeling and a tessitural feeling and an accompaniment, which is absolutely distinct from anything else going on. And it's not as simple as that, because they get involved in what's happening around, and eventually they are, their madrigal falls apart in chaos at the end. And the same with the other, the other characters. There, there, there just has to be a, a, a sort of control of simultaneous lay layers that make harmonic sense with each other. Um, harmonic sense being important so that you know the notes that you're meant to be singing and that, that it, the totality sounds right. Uh, but it, it, everything has to be distinctive and stand out so that, about, in the end, that the people listening can understand the drama as, as it's quickly evolving, and despite the fact that it's going on different layers at the same time, it makes some sort of sense. It make, no, not some, it must make absolute sense, <laughs> is the desire. <laughs> Uh, and your perspective on this, this, this extraordinary scene, what, M Martin, do you want to say a little bit more about it? Well, it was a challenge to me, wasn't it? It was. It was, a kind <laughs> of, it was a challenge to George, and I, I knew that he would respond to it um, because he, he likes, part of him likes difficulty. I knew it was a difficult thing, but I, I, I felt that it was an essential part of the drama, and that's why, at its origin, I, I wrote a scene which is very complex for a composer to... Um, to make music. Can we just hear a little bit about the, 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 the other characters in the piece? We've mentioned uh, Gaveston, your relationship with, with Gaveston, how, how that works and uh, unfolds, the king and, and uh, Gaveston. It's a very deep and intense uh, relationship. Yeah, and the long one. It's been about three years mm -hmm. that Gaveston is now he, he, with King. Uh, he obviously has a power on him, manipulation or something, and, uh, and King doesn't see, doesn't see, doesn't uh, see this power he, he's, he has. I don't know if he doesn't see the situation, political situation and the situation of the country because of Gaveston or because of, of his own personality and maybe he doesn't want to see his things, I don't know. But the, the power Gaveston has on King is quite intense and, uh, and difficult for everybody around, mm -hmm. you especially. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult for me. And, and, you know, of course, we have two children. And uh, one is a, is a singing part. It's for a, a high tenor. And, and the other child, our daughter, is, is an acting part. She doesn't speak, and she's extraordinary. <laughs> it's just amazing what she's doing every day. And then I think the other main character is, is Mortimer. And Mortimer, well, like his name in a way, he's this, this dark kind of, yeah, I mean, he's, he's hard to figure out. But you are, you are having a relationship with him, nonetheless. Well, a relationship. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but I mean, the questions are, is it a political relationship? Is it to save the family? Is it to save the kingdom? Is, is, it, to, is it, I mean, 
<coughs> under what terms does she go into that relationship and do those terms hold? Do, do things turn out the way that she thought? Was she, did she do the right thing? And, um, and certainly, uh, like I said earlier, I, I think there, there is love between us. And there is an intimacy between us. So when that, the decisions are made that, that are, are going to create a very big distance between us, it, it, it's painful. It's not, it's not ruthless or, and not conniving. I remember when, when I asked you to please give me a few words about Isabel, you know, and you, you said she was very intelligent, very beautiful, and possibly conniving, I think was the word you said. And, and then you said, no, definitely. <coughs> and she is, but we all are. <laughs> I mean, we all manipulate. It's just manipulate the hand. We just have, that's what we do. So it's a natural, and, and that's what makes it so human. And yet in opera, it's so larger than life. So, so it's clear these are very human, present, real characters. But the themes that the, the work as a whole plays with, uh, there's, there's one uh, wonderful line that the King uh, sings, don't bore me with the price of bread, don't block my mind with politics. Well, rather naughtily, I thought perhaps that could be tweeted rather than sung. <laughs> uh, there are certain resonances with certain other political figures of the, of the moment. There are, um, was the, the, the parlous state of world politics on your mind when you were making this piece? Did it have any, have any influence on what you were, you were well, doing? Not from my perspective, actually. I, I think it's... Um, I mean, it's interesting that the th three projects that George and I have done together are, are based on texts from the past. And I don't really know why that is, but I think part of it is a desire not to be a part of the rolling 24-hour seven news and to write in a journalistic way. And if you're thinking about politics, one of the characteristics of um, the contemporary world is that there's this huge cloud of bureaucracy which clouds and obstructs our view of the kind of intensity of personal relationships and power struggles. So, one th interesting thing about an old story like this is that it allows you to remove that cloud, or like you're wiping a pane of glass and you kind of see these people. Here they are. They're doing stuff which is affecting everybody's lives. So um, the answer is no, really. I think the answer is no. I think it's more a matter of creating a, um, a powerful mythical world in which we will recognize things, sure, about ourselves, and maybe we'll apply it to things that we think about, political things in the contemporary world. But there's no sense, in my mind at least, of wanting to nail such and such a, a contemporary issue. No. Mm. Far from it. Thank you. Well, I think that's a very good point at which to pause our discussion um, and to open the, the questions to the, the floor. So this is your opportunity, please, to, to put a question to our team here. Hand went up very quickly there. So. Yeah, um, uh, well, first of all, it's a great opportunity to hear all of you tonight. Um, my, my question is for George. Do you think that modern uh, opera music is going in a particular style or direction? The direction of modern opera music, George. There's a big one for you to start with. <laughs> I can't answer that. Um, I just myself do what I want and what I can, and I can't speak for others at all. I try to uh, follow r rather resolutely individual path and do my own thing. But it has to be said also that there's a lot of interest. I do know that there's a lot of interest in in contemporary opera at the moment, which is exciting, very very exciting. And that it was that's across the world. It's, it's here in the UK, but it's it's a general thing as well. So obviously the the, the art form is something has shifted, I think. Thank you. On the front row here. Um, <clears throat> for the composer again, um, having reached the third opera, I wonder if across the span of them there's any sense of musical evolution. I mean, in responding to the drama in this piece. Have you done things in ways that you would not have done in written on skin? Or, or are they sort of largely isolated creative endeavors? I mean, will a musicologist in 100 years' time be able to sort of delineate the progress of George Benjamin's operatic genius? <laughs> 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 I, I, I want to 
So the question is about musical evolution across the works. I, sh I shall resist the opportunity as a musicologist to comment on the second part of the question. <laughs> I, have no, I, I have no idea about that, but I've been forced by my dear colleague to do things I haven't done before, yes. On a structural level, I've had to write scenes that are between 15 and 20 minutes long and to maintain an identity for a scene that it really has a character but it has sufficiently diversity within it to keep it interesting and to follow the drama. And then within the total structure of the piece, the, the, the seven scenes each have their own character and similar attributes, but they join up with each other. That, that, was, new, that was a real challenge. And equally, this second half of scene three was really hard because also you're dealing with voices and they, and they need to find their notes and they need to sing them with confidence. And that means you really you can't hide anything, and you really have to accompany them in a way that helps them. And at the same time, if the structure is complex, that's it's really very, very hard. The other aspect, the other thing I would say is that I don't know and don't want to know. I want to be the servant of the drama while I'm writing and just reflect what's needed. And hopefully, I am forced to discover, to discover new things while doing that. But it's a sort of byproduct. Thank you. There's a lady on the third row there, and then the gentleman behind. Yes, the lady first. I'd just like to add to that. He wrote ensembles in his piece, which he never wrote in the other two operas. The first opera had two characters who largely sang separately. The next opera had more characters who sometimes sang together, but also separately. Now we have more ensembles. I think musicologists will surely pick that up. <laughs> Musicologists will pick up the, the growth of the presence of ensembles in your office. Too. <laughs> well, Sally, who is my publisher, uh, is well informed. Um, <laughs> well, I was wondering, how does she know? <laughs> but it's, it's true. Yes, there, there are, I, as it were, put the narrative pedal down more strongly in certain mm -hmm. times than this. And there, there are moments when five or six singers are, in, are, are, are going in certain passages, yes. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't done that before, yeah. Uh, the gentleman behind? Yep. Uh, I'm interested in all the influences that come together to create a work like that. And you've spoken a bit about your 16th century reading and Marlowe. I was wondering whether you've drawn on any more contemporary uh, forms of art. I mean, for example, the Derek Jarman extraordinary film. Are there any more contemporary influences that you've, which you've looked at, you've drawn into? So just to repeat, the, the question is, uh, we've heard about the, uh, as it were, the historical sources of this piece, but the question is, uh, have, have they drawn on uh, more contemporary sources as well in preparing the, in creating the opera? Well, in, in fact, I, I made a decision quite early on to, to shut out the more contemporary uh, stories of Edward II. I know that the Jarman film exists. I also know that Brecht made a version of, of Marlowe's play, but um, I really wanted to, I really wanted to, a enter the mind, the, the early 14th century mind, to the extent that that is possible. But then just to let the thing open up in a way that I, I conceived it. So I, I, I didn't, I didn't look at those sources, the, the modern sources. But as I say, I did, I did want to explore a world in which the transgression was not so much love between men, which I think we should all now take for granted, please, but the fact that desire leads somebody in one direction, which can be fatal for them. And could we just extend that question to, to Barbara and Stefan in terms of your preparation of these roles? I mean, how, how widely were you, you, you reading? Were you in, investigating uh, the, the, the historical lives of these, these characters and so on? Not at all. Not at all. I, I, on purpose, I didn't want to, to find out very much about Isabel at all because I, I just want to deal with what happens in their story. So I don't want to know, even in a lot of uh, operas that I sing, I don't even want to know what I wouldn't hear in the opera. So I don't mm. want to know the other scenes that I'm not in. I don't know what was said when I wasn't in the room. So I'm very particular about it, to keep it as clean as possible. So I don't watch outside things. And um, for example, when I sang Lulu, I didn't want to uh, read Vedekin's play. I only wanted to look at what Beric had said. And I didn't want to see the, the Louise Brooks, the film. Uh, 
I only wanted to deal with, with the score, what, what we were given. Stefan? Well, I did the opposite. I read the play <laughs> <laughs> and uh, made some researches about uh, who it was second was and the situation at that time, etc. And uh, I was actually a bit surprised and uh, frustrated when we, the first day of rehearsal, when we read to, all together the, the biography that Martin and, uh, and Katie wrote about the characters and the situation. It was a mix between fiction and historical fact. And uh, Katie asked us to forget every research we made before. <laughs> so, and I was quite happy and proud to make, <laughs> make such work, but well. <laughs> So there's a lady here on the front row first, and then we'll take the gentleman there. Now that you're in rehearsal, when you hear your score, are there times <laughs> when you wish you had done something different? Or do you, have you changed it as you go along? <laughs> so the question is about, in the rehearsal process, hearing, hearing the work, do you make changes? Do you wish you'd done something different? <laughs> it's too late to correct whatever blemishes there are on a big scale, because the parts are made and the, the technology is... Of, of altering that for the full orchestra and the singers who've learnt their roles by heart, it's just impossible. But I've already, apart from working in great detail now for three weeks, four weeks with the singers, I had one run-through with the orchestra about three weeks ago, and I can tell you two things. Firstly, it sounds exactly like I expected, because that's my job, <laughs> um, to full stop, but... I have made 60 micro changes already. The strings at one point accompanying Gavison were too pale. I, I thought it would sound too pale, so I put the dynamic up from pianissimo to piano. I made a miscalculation in a special effect I wanted from the cymbalum, and that required me to renotate a good dozen bars of his music. Um, and, and other, I've, I also I'm shifting every now and then uh, the tempo according to how the music sounds and how they sing it. I'm not de 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 letting out a, a great secret that I added a substantial fermata pause for Stefan yesterday, which will add a good, maybe it was up to him because it's his pause, <laughs> between three and six seconds um, in one scene. So yes, I'm making, with, when I have the real flesh of sound in front of me, I, I'm making small changes, which I, have, which I will always do with any given piece, but um, the actual real, gen the, the fundamental structure and sound of the piece is is mm -hmm. too late to change, and, and it's, I have to admit, it's what I wanted. A key component in the evolution of a new work of art must be also, in addition to all things you're doing, the look of it and the staging of it. Now, presumably that has to be fixed much earlier on in the, you can't start changing aspects of that at this stage. So the question is about the, the design, the, the look of the piece, and at what stage that starts, presumably long before uh, the piece has been completed. Yeah. Could you say something about that process? It, it's true that there are very long lead times mm -hmm. for the construction of scenery, particularly in an opera house. Um, having said that, if you're working with a stage director as flexible as somebody, as Katie Mitchell, she will be making quite significant changes all the time about how the work is staged. That's not all plotted in advance. So many changes can be made, and changes can be made to props. Changes can be made to costumes. Those kinds of changes can still be made. But you're right in thinking that the construction is something that has to be determined well in advance, yes. But that doesn't necessarily determine the overall look of the production, because another flexible thing is lighting. So the lighting designer is sitting in the room with us a lot of the time, and he's kind of whispering in Katie's ear or she in, in his, and so they will be making very significant um, decisions which can be changed about how the, the, as the theatrical artifact uh, will look, yes. Thank you. Um, you were talking about world being involved in world premiere, and this is obviously a, a world premiere as well, and I'm just wondering, how often do they then come back, and do you, are you involved in them again, or is it something completely different, and with your particular piece now, with Nolsky and this one, do you see it coming back frequently, or is that just down to the different opera houses, or do you do it differently? I'm just wondering how you learn from mm -hmm. that, having the world premiere to then what happens next, and other people take over, or you've had enough of it, or... <laughs> 
So the question is about re repeat performance. Well, so we could talk about written on skin because it has been performed many, many, many times and not just in the original uh, production and not just with the original singers for whom it was written like you, uh, Barbara. So the, the afterlife of the piece, yeah. Well, um, in my case, you know, I've given over 80 world premieres and some of them you do once and never again. And not because you hated it or anything, just because it's, it's not destined to have a life. And other pieces, you have a feeling about it, that it will live. And it's a kind of uh, a, a midwife role, you know, that you bring this child into the world and then you adopt it and you look after it for a few years, if you're lucky. And that's what happens for me with certain pieces, but sometimes, like, with Written on Skin, I actually deliberately decided not to sing it anymore, and a couple of other pieces that I absolutely love, because a piece by Dutier and a piece by Ligeti, because I didn't want those pieces to, to be so strongly associated with me that they didn't have a nice life with other people. And... So it's, it's an interesting thing to let go of, some, of a piece and to say goodbye to it, especially when you love it. It's like leaving a relationship when it's, everything's going great. <laughs> so why would you leave it? But you do. And uh, it's a strange, a strange feeling. But it's certainly, I mean, with Written on Skin, if I can say, I think we knew in Aix-en-Provence before the premiere we knew maybe two weeks before the premiere that there was so much buzz, and I don't mean buzz like internet and Instagram and stuff like that. I mean buzz like it was just humming, that piece. It was just resonating and vibrating, and we knew that we had something very, very special that we were going to deliver. So it wasn't a huge shock that the piece was successful. And how is it for you, George, because you always conduct the premieres of your own stage pieces? Not always, no. But I have the, these two big operas, yeah, yes. Yeah. How is it for you letting go of it and handing it over to, to somebody else to, to conduct? Oh, I like that very much. I mean, they have to do it well. Uh, <laughs> but if they do it well and do it in a different way, I, uh, I really enjoy it. It's a great pleasure. And I also learn... How to, conduct my, how to conduct it when I go back to it. Things from how other people do it. Pick up a gesture, something, something emphasised there, or something with a hand that could be very, very useful. So um, I really, really like it. I want to stay, like I have done in most of the last 10 years, at home writing more. And therefore, I'm not going to, con when this piece comes back in the years ahead, which we already know, I'm not, I'm, apart from the first two runs, I'm not going to do it. So I have, to, I have to let go, yeah. But I'm really so happy to be doing the first one and shaping it with the people I wrote it for. And uh, it's really such a pleasure. What happens if there's a production of a piece of yours that you don't like? Then it's a very unpleasant evening. <laughs> and, oh, it's hard. Very, very hard. I think we have time for just two, two more questions. So there's a... I was just wondering, when you have a piece that was so successful and so brilliant that's written on skin. Um, how do you feel about then going and doing something else? <laughs> do you feel inspired or are you now nervous or concerned you may not be able to do it again? How do you feel? You, how do you be inspired for two and a half years? How do you feel nervous? You don't. Those sort of feelings are little glimpses, tiny little things. What you do is you Put yourself, at the, as I've said before, at the service of, of the drama and just concentrate until you've written the, the last note and do everything you can to get everything right. Um, it was, of course, <coughs> very encouraging for me as becoming an opera composer to have Written on Skin received in the way it was. Um, and momentarily I may have thought, gosh, uh, to follow that and maybe do something, try to do something better, that's a, quite a challenge. And then starts the, the process, the real process, which is choosing the notes and choosing the rhythms and the tam. And for no other purpose at all, but the need for the work in question. And so such thoughts just disappear. And uh, 
the only thing I'm grateful for, I'm not saying this in a slight way, is to have had a text that has allowed me to write another opera. You, you know, it's not necessarily given that you'll find one that gives you another text and gives you another one. So that, that's what I'm, that's the most important. That was the most important thing for me. Final question. Uh, for Barbara and Stephanie, do you portray your characters to try and win the sympathy of the audience or in another way? Is there anything that's sympathetic to your characters? <laughs> Is there anything sympathetic to your characters? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, they're human. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, they're human beings. So I would imagine everyone would have compassion for other human beings, even if they're struggling. So, yes, but I, uh, to win the favor or the sympathy of the audience, I don't, I don't think that way because I suppose... I suppose I don't think it's necessary. I think when you play the character how you play it and you are true to really to, to the humanity of that person and the complexity of that person, then I don't want to control how the... It's a bit like what Martin said. I thought that was, that's exactly how I think about performance, that I don't care if, really, if the audience likes the piece or, or the character. I want to like it. I want to be excited to play it and, and to feel it and to sing it and to feel the body vibrating with the sound and, and the concentration and the text. And so when that, is, when that vibration is working, I know that there will be people that will be absolutely you know, attracted to that for whatever reason. It's exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with <laughs> Well, on that happy note of agreement, uh, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. But uh, uh, don't forget, of course, you can see this powerful uh, work on the stage of the Royal Opera House, starting on the 10th of May and running through to the 26th of May. Full details on the Royal Opera House website. It merely remains to me to thank very warmly our guests this evening, George Benjamin, Martin Crimp, Barbara Hannigan, Stefan Dugou, and our two pianists, and to you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed.